Oh, no way.
Pursuant to 4.20 of the Spousal City Charter, <coughs> I elected to exercise my right and my power to veto and do hereby veto the City Council's action of the Committee of the Whole authorizing the City to move forward on the Carpenter Lake Interpretive Center. Before I turn back on, over to you, Madam President, uh, I just wanted to reiterate a few points just to refresh memory. The City Council um, made a decision to go to the people of the City of Citizens and ask them for a village. Um, based on the point that we were at as a city with our finances, with declining revenue, with us um, <coughs> looking down the road and projecting out how our revenue was declining and what a negative impact that would have on our ability to provide services. The citizens of this city, um, thank goodness, uh, agreed to trust us to, um, and they approved that millage, increasing the amount of taxes that they pay to the city. As, you know, I believe our word means something. And when we said that we were in a financial uh, crisis without that support, it was a reality. <coughs> this uh, proposal that has been brought forward. We all know Carpenter Lake is one of the gems of our city. We received awards for it. I'm very proud of it. I have walked it with my with my family and really treasured that spot. I think it's one we just recently received another award for it. It's something that we can really add to the list of accomplishments for this city. But what's being proposed is to borrow from our Lord from Fund, using some uh, grants that have been approved to build a $2.1 million building as an interpretive center. There has been debates about the amount of money and to move this discussion forward, we are going to add anywhere from $50,000 to $70,000 more for operation to the parking rent budget. Even if we found the money to build it, it is a fact. Last year, our parks and rent used $800,000 from their fund balance to balance their budget. There is absolutely no funding in their budget for capital projects. The pool was shut down um, a couple times last year there had to be improvements made to it. We had to borrow money from the Lord Fund for our, um, for our golf course. The projection or the request was to borrow the money from the Lord Fund, which by definition, we need to understand that the Lord Fund is for, it's designated for public improvement. I would, I would argue today or state today that building a brand new nature preserve center is not improvement. It's creating a brand new building. If any of you have used our showers in <coughs> the pool area or gone over to the pool with your family and I go over there regularly, there are parts of that building out, out our locker rooms are embarrassing. When we stand in the shadow of um, amazing development that we have in our library, then to walk into something that is dated and has not been updated or improved in years and decades, it is deteriorating. When you look at the pool area, we have water features that don't work. We literally had a hole being ran from, from the faucet to the pool because there was a filter system that was broken on the pool. Those things have to be fixed in order for us to improve or to use our pool, <coughs> which is a service that our residents expect. And I, to me, it was a promise we made if you support the millage, we will maintain the services that we have. So when you look at the, when you look at the budget for parks and rec, has zero in facility improvement. And we cannot continue to maintain this double standard 
of fixing some part of the operations and not another, and then to say, not only are we going to borrow money from our work, which is for public improvement, I wanted to add another thing. Many of us come to the different craft shows or public uh, exhibits that use our pavilion. The men here would not know, but the women, if you try to use that restroom, during the time that we have thousands of people in this pavilion, the ventilation is poor, that restroom is an embarrassment, and it should be updated and fixed. Now, we've had a lot of discussion, why hasn't it been fixed? We're going to move forward. I have a commitment from administration and from the director that these capital improvement items that we need to make in our facility will be projected out and planned so that we can move forward. But you're going to add not only the cost of building it, but add to a budget for parks and rec. Another 74 or whatever number you want to play with it. But you're adding to that budget that already has, will be, if you add anything to the budget, you're going to go to the fund now. And when you start talking about a fund now, that's your savings account. A resident sent me an email today, and she said, Mayor Lord, I support you in this veto. Because you know what? I just got my tax bill who said my taxes have been decreased. Which means the city of South will be getting less money from me. How can we move over to the point of building a nature preserve and services center when I know I'm just one of many? So you're getting less money. <coughs> and we have to figure that out. I will go on the record and I will continue to go on the record. And if anyone misquotes me tonight, you're not telling the truth. I totally support this. I think it's a great thing. My issue for this beach health is not now. We do not have the funding. It is not respectful of the vote of trust that our residents put in us to manage money. We have to keep money in the bank because we have no clue of how much more we're going to take. And the reason why we're sitting here and we, we are a great city is because we have always made sure we kept, we protected our money in the bank and we made budget decisions that will allow us to be strong financially and to be able to protect the infrastructure that we have and for us to be able to provide the services that our citizens want. So today, um, before you again, the, uh, the result of your decision to adjourn to this day is my veto. I stand, I stand behind it, and I feel strongly that we should, as a left side, keep our words to the residents, do the right thing, and keep this, keep this project because we have paid for the design. And all of that does not go away. We have paid the architects. We have the design. And that we can build this at another time when we have the money. And it will be something we'll all be happy to go and cut the ribbons <coughs> on and enjoy. Right now, Carpenter Lake is fabulous the way it is. This would enhance it. And it can be enhanced at a later date, at a later time, when we all can be on the same page that it's the right time to build it. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, I have, I know that a number of people are here to speak about Carpenter Lake, and I want to give them that opportunity. We have people who want to speak at the next meeting. I, I had a number of phone calls, and I see some people that I recognize in the audience. I want the only the people that are here to speak about Carpenter Lake to um, give them an opportunity to speak and come to the platform. Um, anyone want to be first? I think you have a list of people who have come to speak. That's not, I don't for Carpenter Lake. I have for the police officers later on. And let, let me just say to the, um, to the uh, people that have come to the second meeting, we this is the last meeting of the year, and we have business to take care of tonight.
tonight we have people here for a liquor license and that is why we chose to put the public comments from the, the police officers and those with the city in the thing. That's, that's why we put that at the end because we don't want to keep people here who are here for, for city business. And if this were not the last meeting of the year, we wouldn't have to do this. So what I'm going to ask of you is give your uh, name and address for the record. If you don't want to give your address, you can give it to the, this late young lady sitting right here. Uh, some people don't want to do that. They don't want to give their address. But, um, since we're not live because of our equipment, we're not live, are we? I don't think we are. And it's because we have an equipment failure that we can't put our final task. So we're probably all right. Um, you have five minutes to address this council, and I want it just to be those people that came to speak about the carpenter like me, too, sir. My name is Marie Henry. My address is 20260 Brookshire, B-R-O-O-K-S-H-I-R-E, Southfield, Michigan, 48076. And I agree with Mayor Lawrence's veto. Uh, I think that any time you spend $2.1 million building a facility, you've got to look at the operating and the maintenance cost of the facility down the line. And that is something that will be on uh, an added uh, uh, expense to the taxpayers. And as Mayor Lawrence has pointed out, there are other things that we need to be doing uh, to uh, improve our infrastructure. And uh, so I'm, I'm, I'm against it, and I think there are many uh, other residents that are against it too. I don't know, but I think you are supposed to represent the people when you make decisions, and I think you should talk to the people in the community and see, it's a good idea, yes, but nature's all around us. I mean, I have rabbits. I have uh, all kinds of critters. Uh, nature's all around us. And if, uh, I don't know what you plan to put in the nature center, but it's going to cost money to maintain it. And I think that $75,000 is just uh, a drop in the bucket. And that's all I have to say. Thank you very much. Thank you. Good evening. Pamela Gerald, P.O. Box 155, Southfield, Michigan, 48037-0155. My telephone number is 248-352-9188. I'm sure that um, the mayor will be pleased to hear that I also agree with the veto. We have a lot of other pressing things in this city. We have bad roads, roads that flood. We have sewage issues from default, from, sewage, from the system that wasn't built maybe properly. These are some of the allegations about the flooding. Um, look at Evergreen Road, Evergreen floods, so bad right in front of City Hall that it's embarrassing to say that this is the road <coughs> in front of the municipality. I agree with Ms. Henry, I agree with the mayor. No one is against this project. It's beautiful to have all of these nature things, but as she said, and she said it best, nature is all around us. We don't need a new facility at this time. I'm disappointed to find out that there was a donation made by Denzo of 150000 and I stand to always be corrected if my information is not accurate, and that that company will in the future be coming to the city asking for a tax abatement. Now, I know that most of the council up here, you're gun ho about approving tax abatements. You have shown that. You gave Lear Corporation an irre irrevocable 20-year deal. But what Ms. you're Carol, not... Carol, please stay on, on point. Please. please stay on point. On topic. 
certainly faces. Look at our magnificent library. That certainly was a difficult and long project, but you stayed the course over many years and you showed courage in the face of equal difficulties. And look at last year's um, millage that the mayor referred to. I don't know how many city governments would have actually put that on the ballot. I applaud you, and I applaud the, whatever the huge rate of success was, whatever the vote was. That, that's a courageous thing that we did in South Dakota, that you did. And now we have this education center. And I sometimes wonder if you can't see the forest for the trees, if you'll pardon my pun. Have you suddenly forgotten that we are creating this because it's important that the kids of this suburban, urban community need opportunities to experience nature. It is precisely because we are in Southfield. They don't have access to nature, to the environment, and to the importance of connecting to the environment. With the completion of this center, kids can connect with nature. They can actually learn by being in nature. And ultimately, they will be better stewards of nature. What better reason is there than to finish, to finish this project? I am further concerned about the blow to our image that this veto creates, certainly to the DNR, who will laugh us off the face of their desk the next time we apply for a grant. I have sat in on those, um, those uh, whatever they call them, meetings. And if you think that we're going to get a grant 10 years from now, it won't be half of what we get now. So to think in 10 years that we will ever get this kind of money, we won't. <laughs> it is a blow to our image certainly to the DNR, DNR, to the EPA, and all the other granting agencies that have already committed to this project. This is not the way the city of Southfield should be taking care of its business, nor do I think the veto is a fiscally responsible move. Rather, I think it is the reverse. To throw away thousands of dollars already committed to this project, to throw away thousands of hours of tireless effort for this think big to think outside the box, necessary project is to say that you can't or you won't stay the course. I think it's bad going. Ten years ago, when I was part of a very successful grassroots effort of the Urbanian Project, it was an equally difficult, though far faster, finish. I stood before this council and I asked then, and I ask you again now, what makes a city great? Are you, and by extension all of us, reasonable people, able to sit down, work together, throw away your political differences, to do great things for not only the adults of this community, but for the future of this community? Or are we quitters in the 11th hour? Do you want to be the city council that couldn't finish what you and your predecessors so carefully planned? I know most of you. I don't think you do. I don't think you want to be the council that couldn't stay the course, couldn't honor all the years of hard work by you and so many others. I believe that throughout this long journey called Carpenter Lake, you have embodied the spirit of Southfield, one that never gives up, and one that has the courage to finish what you started. Thank you. John Delisle, 30775 Longcrest. Uh, I, I had the pleasure of meeting Gail in 2007 uh, for a stewardship network work day at Berberian Woods. I would like to uh, dovetail on uh, her, her emphasis um, about doing the right thing and using city's resources to accomplish something which has uh, inherent value um, both from uh, a conservation standpoint, um, an education standpoint, and I think potentially a, a financial standpoint. 
know, our grant programs um, and our funding has been severely cut um, in the last couple of years, so that there's no guarantee that that potential will exist in the future. Um, I, I feel that this is a once in a life opportunity for um, the Southfield community to lead the area in environmental education um, at a low cost and a high potential impact um, in our community and in the surrounding community. Um, and I, I think that it actually could be a revenue generating um, resource um, from the perspective of sc school districts in the area using it for educational programs. There's a, there's a track record in other communities of this um, this being a, a, a very beneficial um, if, if operated, you know, in it um, with, with regard to, to, the, to the school programs that they would like to have at nature centers. Um, so, so, you know, places like Detroit, Ferndale, Royal Oak, Glazer Village, Huntington Woods, these are all communities that, though they have green school initiatives, they have nowhere to do field work, where a nature center would give them a place to go and lear learn about the biological systems and then to bring those things that they learn into a, a, cl a classroom environment um, that they don't have in their home district. <coughs> so, you know, in conclusion, um, I, I think it would be, you know, uh, just a, a, an invaluable resource for the community. Um, and, and really, you know, if, you, if you've been to Carpenter Lake, um, it's a, it, it is a beautiful place, but to, to really understand all the intricacies of what go, go on in those ecosystems, having the nature center is something that, you know, can, you know, show people the details that, that are given in that, in that beauty and, you know, especially to the younger generation to, to help them understand and therefore make good decisions about the environment and the future. This really is the right time and, and the only time to get this. Good evening. Good evening. My name is uh, Robert Ann LeCook. I'm the current Executive Vice President of the Southfield Police Officers Association here in the city. What is your name? Robert A. M. LeCook. L E C O U F F E. Okay, are you speaking about Captain Lake? I am, ma'am. I'll be very brief. Nothing is in jeopardy. There isn't anything in jeopardy by halting this project. At a current time when we're 26 police officers shy and 13 firefighters shy, I believe it uh, is good business sense, it's smart business sense, and it's not silly to halt this project at this current time. I speak for the union as a whole and its members. We find it extremely insulting at a time when wages are being frozen and benefits are being reduced that you would move forward with this project. I applaud the mayor and any council member that has halted this project. It's a gem as it stands currently. You stand not to lose anything by halting the project. To the best of my knowledge, you own the property or the city owns the property. There's money already spent involving the property. You can complete the project at a later time. By supporting this project at this time and looking toward its completion, you're telling union employees that they are undervalued. That's all I have to say at this time. Thank you. Uh, Mr. McKeith, you did not give us your, an address. My current address is 22206 East 12 Mile Road in the city of St. Clair Shores, Michigan. The zip code there, ma'am, is 48081. Did you get that, Chair? All right, thank you. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Greetings. My name is Wendell Gramlich. I'm the president of the Southfield TPOAM Career Employees. I represent about 135 employees. When our union first started, we had over 200 employees. Um, today I'm here to support uh, Mayor Brenda Lawrence's veto and her position on the Carpenter Lake Nature Center. With the current fiscal state of uh, the city of Southfield and with the projection of 10% less revenues for 2012, you know, we believe 
that it is not the right time to do this project. We believe that the Nature Center, the Carpenter Lake project right now as it is, is a really nice place to visit. There's plenty of nature there, but by putting this on hold, you know, until the city's in a better financial situation, that is the right choice to do. Thank you. Did you give your uh, name and address? Yeah, I'll give it to Terry. I'd like you to give it publicly. Yes. My address is 35441 Glen Street, GLEN, Westland, Michigan, 48186. And I, I decided I didn't get your name again. Wendell uh, Ramlich, G R A M L I C H. And I'm the Southfield TPOM Career Employees President. Right. Thank you.
support Mayor Lawrence's veto. Uh, I would say that uh, there is hardly a day that I'm not at Carpenter Lake. I'm there almost every single day, and I enjoy it the way it is. I'm sure that there can be wonderful things done in the future with the Nature Center, but uh, it's beautiful the way it is, and uh, um, I know that because I'm there almost every single day. Thank you. Greetings. Hello. My name is Alexander Cargillis. I live at 25520 Ingleside Drive, Southfield, of Michigan. I've been a resident of Southfield, Michigan for almost 50 years. I've lived through the discussions and the debate for Carpenter Lake. And I really appreciate the sincerity of those who work for Carpenter Lake. A gentleman just before me, a gentleman before me, asked a very important question. Is this a want or a need? Well, to answer that question, throughout the world, through the major universities, the University of Michigan, Wayne State, <coughs> Lawrence Technological University, where I teach for the last 20 years, <coughs> what are we addressing? The countries of the world, China, India, United States, the European Union, what are they addressing? We are trying to teach our young people how to protect the environment. The Carpenter Lake Project is not a want, it's need. Thank you.
we should proceed with the center. I inquired about exactly what this center will look like, what will it involve, you know, what kind of programs will be made available. And I went to Parks and Rec, and they didn't have any brochures, no indication of what this presentation uh, was about that was made in um, 2010 when it was made to the city council. I don't know how many of you were on that council back in 2010, but where are the plans that show how many rooms are going to be involved? How ma uh, what is going to show the kids how to interact with the environment? I mean, we're talking about all this, but where's the concrete plans for this? Is, is it anywhere in Southfield? Is that available for the residents for us to look at? Can anybody answer that question? Yes, it is. We've had public meetings. We've had we have had public meetings on this. This has been going on. I understand, but I'm saying yes. the actual plan so that we can look at it, the drawings of what the building will, you know, be. They're not on public display, but they are available. How can I get an opportunity to look at those plans? Uh, give us your contact information, and we'll have someone contact you. Okay. So you can't do it tonight because the I understand, here. but I, you know, for the past week and a half, I've been working on this. Like I said, I went to Park Direct. I've talked to, um, uh, I think, Ms. Tyler. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And nobody has these plans available. And since this has been worked on and uh, there's been a pre-approval by um, the grant person, it seems like it wouldn't be very easy just to make these documents, you know, available to the residents. Um, so based on the fact that I don't know what this interpretive center would look like, um, what is going to be involved in helping the children educationally, I can only go by what the information I have. And on the information I have, it seems to me that we do need to upgrade, repair, expand the activities that the children are currently involved in. They're involved in swimming, they're involved in skating, they're involved in the parks in their own communities. And like someone said, Carpenter Center is, Carpenter Park, Lake Park, is a beautiful situation. I'm glad it's there too. It took millions of dollars to create the lake and, and more money to create the path. And it's like most parks. When I go to Kensington Park, or Belle Isle, I don't say, oh, where's the center? I want to go and see that. I want to see nature. And that energizes. And as far as educational, there are other ways that children can learn about Carpenter Lake and a natural environment other than just with a structure. Um, students can, like they do with, with the Rouge, take uh, water samples and learn from that. They can uh, do research in school and then come back to the lake and then look at these things. They're very creative things. Uh, the young people are very much into technology. They can make their own video tapes of things. They can uh, interact with uh, students from not only this area but around the world through the internet and through um, and so forth, and to share what they're doing in their environment. Um, so because I don't have any information on what this center is, and I know that the city is hurting for money, because we cannot guarantee that we're always going to have money to, to uh, vote yes for villages, at this time, with no information that I have for me, to make an informed decision, I would agree that it's not the right time right now. But with more information, maybe. But I don't have the information right now. Thank you. My name is Susan Vogel Cousin, um, 25400 Ingleside, Southfield. Um, I've worked on the Carpenter Lake project for about 10 years or so, and with 
under the assumption that it was a fait accompli, so the veto came as a surprise. I've listened to all the comments, and I think a lot of the comments are due to lack of dissemination of information or disinformation. I support the fire and the police departments. I vote for every millage. I believe that taxes buy things, and I will pay my fair share. I have no problem with that. As far as the comment of nature's all around us, yes, it's all around us until it isn't. Put fertilizers and pesticides and other kinds of pollutants all over the land, and the nature will not be all around us. As far as flooding on specific streets, there are low-impact development ideas that can ameliorate the damage and the stormwater runoff. These are all things that we in the Nature Center, this is all information. It was our plan, the six major conservation organizations, including Friends of the Rouge, with whom I take water samples. But then we take the water samples back to the interpretive center in Dearborn rather than processing them on site. We have a Carpenter Lake Nature Center. We could be sampling that water and doing our macro and vertebrate work, bringing them up to the center and having a fantastic science teaching experience for our children. So in answer to what the city entails, basically the idea among the environmental groups who have been involved to date is to form a non-profit 501c3, Friends of the Carpenter Lake Nature Center, just as we have Friends of the Rouge. And then we would set about our fundraising. This does not take care of the maintenance cost or any of the purchase in price. The second part is, if you look at a recent article that was published in Metro Detroit Magazine for Children, they did a piece on the best nature centers in Michigan. And there are ten of them. And none of them, the closest one to us, I think, is the Farmington Hills Center. They have varying degrees of activities available. What I envision for Carpenter Lake to start with is no animals, no elaborate displays, but classroom space and chairs and places where people can bring their classes to come in and they would be taught by or mentored by trained environmental volunteers such as myself who have credentials in specific areas. We would work on a volunteer basis. There's no additional charge to the city of Southfield for any of that. I was led to believe there was a $6 million fund that Parks and Rec has been sitting on. I'm told this is a fund that's for an emergency or it's for something else down the line. I'd like to know when the last thing was built in Southfield. And as far as, I've had no idea, I mean, I've had opinions stated, but I have no factual information on what that money is for and if it could ever be used. I understood that this was the backup for the $1 million loan to be repaid to the city of Southfield at 3% interest over a long period of time. These financial details are things that you people are privy to that we know nothing about. But again, this is all restricted money. It can't be used for hiring or payroll, was what we were under the impression. So it can't be used to hire the policemen we need, even though 12 senior policemen have retired. I understand they have not been replaced. So you have 12 senior policemen's salary and benefits, theoretically, and yet no one has been hired to replace them. So there are all kinds of complicated issues that obviously I won't know anything about as an outsider, but the council and the mayor do know about these things. But I would like someone to give some thought before they act this project, and that's what it is, the end of the project, to the impact that this has on the children of Southfield and Oakland County and the future revenues. Everybody's looking backwards. I'm looking to the future. The people who come in on bus loads as they go to E.L. Johnson or Douglas Evans right now from schools in the vicinity, not just Southfield or Oakland County, and to the minimal charges we can make, the revenue we can generate through a variety of programs. I go to meetings on environmental and ecological gardening. We go and we rent a place to have those meetings. Or if we have a 10-week class course, we rent those places out. Those are regular courses that go on, and each of the organizations has something like that. So there is potential to make money off of the center. It's not just a drain on the city of Southfield. But I feel that the educational benefit and the loss of the possible experience hands-on that the children have when they see something, or the adults have. You know, the person who's out there dumping the pesticides and everything or doesn't know the latest grass clips on it equals one nitrogen fertilizer or three per year. These are things that the community of Southfield needs to know about, and we need to be a center where information can be disseminated that will benefit all of us for the long term, not just for this moment. Thank you very much. Thank you. Anyone else? 
Magnetario P.O. Box 336, Southfield, Michigan 48037. Pardon me for my uh, laryngitis. <coughs> resident and property owner in the city of Southfield. I support the mayor's veto on this. Uh, all of those who are in favor of this seem to have some environmental agenda that Carpenter Lake is going to go away or disappear if we don't build this interpretive center. Oh yeah? They want the project, and we've had outsiders come in and try to tell us what to do with our tax money. To the outsiders, I say, close your mouth, open your wallets, and leave a donation on the way out. Do not tell Southfield taxpayers what to do with their money. Did any of us here need an interpretive nature center while we were growing up? No, of course not. Back in those days, the schools toured biology. They piled kids onto buses and took them out into the woods and the fields. That's how they learned the difference between a butterfly and a bullfrog. They're not going to learn it by sitting in a classroom, looking out the window, or having a pile of papers in front of them. You know, has anyone looked at their tax bill lately? On there, you've got millages for Oakland County Parks. You're on Clinton Metropolitan Authority, which is Kensington, Proud Lake, Island Lake, and who knows how many other places. There are real wild, more wild places if you want to get youngsters out to so-called commune with nature. Uh, personally, uh, those of you up there that don't already hate me, let me give you a reason too. In my personal opinion, Carpenter Lake is nice, it's cutesy, but really it is an overrated postage stamp side mud puddle when compared to what we are paying taxes for in the county. Why are we not using what we are paying for? We can ill afford this expense at this time with all our infrastructure problems. I support the mayor in her wise veto of this. And many of you probably know I've had uh, ill uh, <coughs> ill votes and ill things and has not have not always supported the mayor, but on this I think she is leading the way. Thank you very much.
consultant. There are not very many places we can go in our city and bring our family and enjoy. And if you're a mom like me, you hope there's a bathroom. You hope there's a place you can sit down and have lunch and learn and talk with your kids. Some of you that may not be important, but for me that is. I have a few more kids to go in. That's important to me. Now, I understand from what Mr. Charette did say, there was money. He explained how the money could be dispersed and if we were to do this, in which way it could happen. And then I understand that we have money already on board. And I understand that we have money to come. And in my own understanding, I do know as a member and chair of the Friends of the South Hill Library, we do bring in money from sponsors, people that support what you believe in. So for those of you that are environmentally upon things, I would appeal to you to understand that this is important for Southfield. If we don't get the center, I'll be going back to Dearborn. And let me tell you what I do when I go to Dearborn. I drop my kids off, I shop there, I eat there, and I stay around there. That's what I do with my money, and it's not in Southfield. Now, I always talk to my kids about the present because we live in the present. If you have money now, use it now. And when the time does change, the cost of building will change as well. And if we can start it now, we can appeal to receive money. If it fails, let it fail because we didn't try. But let's give it a chance. Let's give it a chance because this is something that we can support. I would be more than happy to give a million dollars if I had to support it. I don't, but I would be more than happy to raise, a, my, raise my sleeves up and say, let's get to work and make it happen. And um, again, in closing, I would hope that this is not a political thing. And, you know, I understand that there is short of money, but we need to have, like I said before, some hope here in Southfield, and we need to have some things for our family and friends. And it's nothing wrong with bringing outside people. Outside money is good, as a matter of fact. Money is dream, and I think that's important. And I would like to appeal to you again. I said those of you that did turn it down, I respect the decision. But please think about that. Not only will my money go somewhere else, someone else's money will go somewhere else too. And I think the time is now. We have money on board. We can get more money. And for those of you that are not seeing it, I understand. Like I said, I respect your decision. What you don't see, but let's look at what we have in front of us. Thank you. I love this city. I plan on raising the rest of my kids here and living here and contributing as much as I can. Thank you. Thank you, Tim. Anyone else? Looks like we're finished. Um, Council? Madam Chair? Mr. Sakasi. Let me try to. Um, to get this thing started and so that we stay focused on the nature preserve it as it has been planned over the last uh, few years. Actually it started in 1985. But let me uh, state this that I respect the mayor uh, voting for the uh, veto in this because uh, everyone has the opportunity to, to uh, take a side on each side of an issue. However, I told her that I was really disappointed that she took the opportunity to uh, to uh, veto this item because not only is it uh, important to our young people, I see some real estate people in the audience, which try to sell the city to new residents. We have some 1,600 vacant homes in the city. You know, we put them on a bus, buy them breakfast, and take them run around the city to show what we have. And the city has always been in the forefront of building unique and challenging uh, programs. Uh, we've been building buildings for quite some time in, in the area of Peach Woods and the Civic Center Arena and those kinds of things. And it's been the most historically important that we continue uh, to be in the forefront. Um, there's no doubt that I am for this nature center. I know we have kind of a divided group here. Uh, glad to see that the unions made it here from wherever they live. Uh, but, you know, 
They're looking at it from one side of the coin. And let me then talk about the city of Southfield, though. Uh, the residents in this city have always looked for the unique things to come about. It had pleasure in using parks and recreation facilities. And the individuals who have spoken have not really looked at the charter. I'd like to bring you up to date with the city charter in that the money that is being used cannot be spent on anything else but programs and projects in parks and recreation. They get their own millage, they get their own library also gets their own millage, and we also, the city, have a government entity that has a general fund and a budget. Uh, the uh, Carpenter Lake Restoration and, and Nature uh, Preserve is a 42-acre site that has been in the development stages in the United States since 1985. Uh, we have almost $4.5 million dollars in this project already. Uh, the project started, we had to rebuild a dam, take the silt out of the Carpenter Lake, uh, we put in the porous uh, parking lots uh, at a great expense. Uh, that was a grant, all these are grants. Uh, we have accumulated $1.2 uh, million dollars towards this uh, development, and we have a balance of some $980,000 uh, left to come up with. Uh, we have really done a workout on this uh, project. I sit on the finance committee and we worked over the Parks and Recreation uh, Commission and the Parks and Recreation uh, uh, Director, Acting Director, and we have been able to figure out how we can afford this without dipping into any funds other than what is presently there. Uh, notice the mayor is leaving the room. I was hoping she would stick around and listen because. Okay. <laughs> well, should I hold my comments to get back? No. no, let me say this. I, I don't mean to be kind of worked up over this, but, but you know, um, I've been around for 42 years. And I've seen us start with the life support. We began life support, as you know, today in 1972. We built facilities, two arenas in Beachwoods and the city center. We built courtrooms, jails, police department facilities. All of these years, we were always considered in the forefront of a lot of things. We started the Rouge cleanup in the city of South Bay, which now is being credited uh, really as a priority all along the Rouge, keeping it clean. city of South Bay has bought all of the floodplains that we can possibly buy from Eight Mile Road North. And, uh, and people have been able to enjoy, enjoy uh, going through the various paths that have been developed in the floodplains. And a lot of corporations take their children through those and their off hours. There's a, uh, a problem in that we've gone this far, and it's important to mention that this is not as mentioned that there isn't information available. I don't know who they approached in the Parks and Rec, but there are not only plans and drawings, but materials. We have had hearings on it where the architect has brought in the various types of materials which to be used, uh, how it was going to be uh, set in its place, and, and how it was going to be used for educational purposes. And has been designed for buses and for educational purposes. Um, this project is that's not dropped in the sky, but all this period of time that, that we had, and we had a meeting on the 14th of, of this year, that we met because there was a signing that had to take place before the 23rd of November. And we met in kind of an emergency session because it had to be signed to go ahead and to save the $500,000 grant that was available. So all during this period of time, you know, there was no mention of, of not being for this project. Uh, the mayor, the mayor's Parks and Recreation Board, the council, uh, site plan committee, it has to go through the site plan, and we had to extend that because it had uh, come to an end. But all these, this period of time, since 1985, we have not had any discussion that wasn't stated Let's go forward, it's a great project. So I don't really know why we sit here, uh, pardon me, I don't need faces made while I am talking. If you'd like to wait out 
hallway until I get through, uh, I would greatly appreciate it. But because it's really important that we discuss this as, as residents of this community. Who are you talking to? Who's making the faces, Pam? Excuse me, but I'm just trying to move on. Stay focused All right? on carpet and lake, okay? Stay focused on carpet and lake. Pam, you know, you have a chance maybe sitting in this seat. You know, I don't hold this seat. I didn't buy it. You know, I sit here and represent this community. Uh, anyways, they, uh, we have, have continued to go forward with this project, the financing. We have told them how to do it. Uh, did meet with the city administrator through these workouts, and there's around six million dollars that was sitting in the, in the fund balance at Parks and Rec. They used one million of it to do the greenery at Beachwoods project. But it's a it's very important that we look at it this way. And I'm sure that the real estate people who are trying to sell these homes get it. Number one, they want fine schools. Number two, they want places for the young people to grow up and have things that complement the city. And any time you talk to the young people, they want to be seen around the city and what the city has to offer. We started with hockey, baseball, softball, all these different things. We have not really finished the job that we have started with Beachwood, or with uh, Carpenter Lake. And here's the opportunity to go forward with this so that we serve the community and complement whatever we have presently and go on. I have to be a builder. I enjoy, not a builder, builder, but a builder of a city, trying to complement everything that we can do so that we become equal to all these other communities. Some time ago, you know, there was an editorial that South was all done. And, and I had to respond to that editor that South Hill would never be all done because we would stay ahead of the movements, we would stay ahead of what we have and offer choices to our community that would be an advantage to them in living close to these proximities. Uh, there has been mention about the economy. Everybody knows that we're really hurting in this economy, everybody including myself and my children. But you have to keep building at the same time. Use the opportunity that we have now when grants are available to the tune of $1.2 million to go ahead and proceed with this because it will not be available. The agency that is coming up with the $500,000 is, is uh, going to be abandoned by the present administration in the state. Uh, you look at the things that we have done in this community that maybe the residents don't understand that we have accomplished it, but we have spent a lot of money in parks and recreation that have not been supposedly on the surface where you could see it. And, it, and they continue to spend money to enhance what we have. The mayor mentioned the Beachwood, or sorry, the South Hill Arena and the swimming pool, the lockers. But we also had something happen at that arena that, that was encouraging and that helped us make good up a step, and that is that we leased it to Little Caesars. So from the hockey side of it, we have all new uh, lights, we have all new boards, we have all new glass, we have it all cleaned up, we have helped in banding the, the uh, ice uh, machines, we have, they have now controlled the restaurant that's in there, they have done the locker rooms for the hockey players. We have Lawrence Tech and, and Little Caesars playing hockey there, paying premium prices to skate in this arena. Secondly, in the area of roads, this city has done 10 mile road, 12 mile road, Telegraph Road, Angster, and Franklin, just to mention a few. And, and we're, so, we're building the infrastructure so people can drive through this city and see that we're not sitting back and letting our infrastructure rot. We're not sitting back and waiting for something else to drop. We're way ahead of the game. Financially, there will be no money taken out of the, the general fund this year to balance the budget. And we've worked very hard to accomplish this. And, and I know that it's hard to say, well, can I spend uh, the money for this project? But you know, it's $900,000. Just to give you an example, uh, we had a change order on Franklin Road, which was $800,000, and 
and we were able to meet those commitments. So we do have emergency funds. The uh, uh, individuals who came up to speak uh, regarding the, uh, I guess, the employees of the city that, uh, I guess, I got to uh, answer them as soon as I find my page. But it's very important that, uh, that it be told. If I get the document that I have.
in 1998. Uh, and, and six of the elected officials in this calendar are actually still sitting in this room right now. And I, I was jealous because in the robust economy of 1998, of the 1990s, you, uh, you got to make the investments that our city uh, highlighted in this calendar. And I was jealous because I knew that wasn't going to get to be my opportunity uh, in this 2011 economy as a city council member. And to put it a little bit even further in perspective, uh, as, as someone who's coming of age in this recession, I'm among the first generation uh, in which my peers might not have it better uh, than our parents. We were told that if you go to college, if you do well, if you follow the rules, you're going to have a job, you're going to have a, have a good life. Uh, and, and that was not necessarily the promise made to us. Um, and I don't, I don't mean to bring that forward as a sob story, but this is an important first vote that I'm, I'm taking as a new council member. So going forward, I do want to illustrate from my experiences uh, the broader context that I'm operating under from my own experiences. And we're going to have a wildly different experience than we had in 1998. And we're going to have to turn down or delay projects, worthwhile projects, like the Nature Center, because this economic climate demands that we be strong and diligent guardians of our city's dwindling revenues. Um, it, it, it's easy and it, it's easy to want to say, I want to make everybody happy. I, I want to walk out arm in arm with everybody and, and everyone said, you know, we, we are all happy about the decisions that were made, uh, but, but we're not here to make easy decisions. We're here to make tough decisions. We're here to make fiscally responsible decisions. And I cannot support taking nearly a million dollars out of what is essentially a seven and a half million dollar emergency loan fund for the city. If we do that, then we just have to hope and pray that the city doesn't have a six and a half million dollar emergency. Uh, because sometimes we'd be out of luck. Uh, and just judging from this past summer when I was canvassing door to door, and you might recall we had unprecedented flooding throughout the city. I met residents who for the first time were homeowners for 30 years gut gutting the carpet in their basement. Uh, and uh, if we have rains like that coming forward or any sort of sinkhole, the very first place we go is the LERP. And we have to keep the LERP intact for projects of essential infrastructure upgrades and emergencies, not projects of choice even if those projects of choice are worthwhile. And we have to keep two things in perspective. First, like I said at the, the committee of the whole meeting, this isn't an either or project. Either we build the center or we pave over Carpenter Lake tomorrow. Uh, the Carpenter Lake area is going to remain beautiful and well preserved. Um, we put strong focus on that as the city, and as was mentioned two weeks ago, we, we earned the uh, 2011 Oakland Award. It was an unsolicited award. They recognized us uh, two weeks ago, Oakland County. Uh, the second thing uh, is that the reason we're, we're discussing this issue now with a sense of urgency is because the Michigan Department of Natural Resources grant is what's set to expire on November 23rd. And there was a lot of discussion at that November 14th Committee of the Whole meeting that we don't act now, we'll never see that money again, $500,000 will be lost, and the project is done. Um, I, well, nobody articulated why and if that was the case. And part of the area of expertise that I do bring to the table is that I, I work my day job for Southfield in Lansing. Uh, so I did a little bit of, uh, I guess, background, um, and I found out a little bit more about the MDNR grant. And we're not, we're not punished or precluded for going back for a grant in the future. The reason that this firm deadline was in place is because we asked for an extension uh, numerous times. And, and the MDNR said it, it's okay to come back and reapply when you're able to properly finance and finish this project. Money is there for consideration of this project if we, prove, if we move forward in a healthier economy than today. In addition, I don't think we've been aggressive in, 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 in pursuing all other available grants and donations for this project. So why are we letting one grant, which is less than one quarter of the total project cost, dictate the timeline of this project and rush the construction, which has now been delayed by another four weeks because we delayed the veto? And one of the reasons that we we're even having this adjourned meeting is because we were um, to hear from a major corporation that was going to invest heavily in this project. And I just, I'm curious, I just want to know what the, if there's an update to that, because I haven't heard anything about that, um, and that's why we're sitting here. 
at, at this meeting. So given all the I've said and given you kind of a, a background of, of why I'm going to vote the way I'm going to vote, I would support a project like this if we were as aggressive in seeking funding for it as we were in extending the MDNR grant. But for this one grant, I think it's serving as a distraction to moving forward with other funding options. And it's now dictating the rush timeline of this project. So uh, one of my first uh, official actions, uh, I'm going to uphold the veto because uh, given the current funding option as presented, and it was well presented, well thought out, and if the best possible funding option for this project is to dip into emergency funding, I don't think that's the fiscally responsible decision to make in this economy. Madam Chair, Madam Chair, let me kind of uh, make a little correction. Number one, the city is well funded. The city is not in any financial difficulty. And it's not taken into emergency funds. The funds that are available, as I stated, Parks and Recreation has their own funds. They have funds that will support this and many other emergencies that may come about, but it's mostly for capital spending. And so, you know, I, I just want to add that, that, you know, the agency that is giving us the 500,000, just one of those agencies, uh, we're getting uh, uh, $500,000 from the MDNR grant, 140000 from the EPA grant, and we've had a donation, and the city has some $275,000 left on the table after architectural fees. But I, I just wanted to, to correct the fact that we do not go begging for money. We are solid, we went for a village because police and fire, we wanted to be the best there is in the area. And some of that money went to, of course, to library and parks and rec because the charter state said it must. And the money that parks and recreation has can only be spent on their projects and their programs. And whether or not there's something in the future that is going to be available I guess that's guesswork, because what's coming down from the state is totally different than what is being said tonight. We're getting cut each and every day, and, and I'm sure that if we do not get this approved tonight, that it's probably the chance that we will not see it ever built. And uh, that is not a scare tactic, that is just the facts, because everything that's coming down from the state is just getting into the city's pocket. Um, but uh, I just wanted to correct our young new colleague here, and, uh, and I have the budget here for me now because it was given to me by the city administrator, and no money will be spent out of a general fund this year. We don't have a balanced budget. Mr. <coughs> About uh, two months ago, um, I received a call from uh, Deputy City Administrator Fred Zorn asking me um, uh, where I stood on the um, Carpenter Lake Interpretive Center. And uh, the reason for his call was that he wanted to know, um, he and Ms. Uh, Seymour were planning to go to Lansing to see if they could get an ex another extension on the grant. And um, uh, my response at the time was that I support the Interpretive Center. Um, and I supported all along Carpenter Lake, that 30-year saga of uh, capturing that uh, environmentally sensitive property. Um, but it really wasn't until, uh, and, and so I encouraged him, sure, go to Lansing, see, see if you can preserve that, um, extend that grant. Um, uh, but it wasn't until um, a month ago that um, the funding for uh, this project was laid out uh, to me as uh, one council member. Um, and I find that this presents a real dilemma for me. Um, I've lived here over 45 years. In the 1960s, um, uh, first of all, I consider myself a tree hugger. Uh, in the 1960s, I started um, a recycling program in the neighborhood for newspapers. <laughs> Uh, when our elm trees started to die, um, we did an injection and spraying program. And when we lost trees, we started a, um, a, a tree replacement program. 
that the city ended up adopting citywide. Um, as an educator, uh, I've pushed recycling uh, in all of the local schools. Um, I've worked with the South Oakland Water Authority on uh, establishing rain gardens in our community. As a council member, I'm extremely proud of the fact that in the 10 years that I've been on council, we have added 56 acres of uh, environmentally sensitive uh, property to our, our public trust. Um, and uh, all of these things uh, I did um, with, uh, with great gusto and enthusiasm because I think it's important. But what we have before us now is um, a very expensive proposition. And um, Mr. Fercasi has said, well, it's guesswork to think that we'll get uh, grants, uh, that we'll, we won't get a grant in the future. It's also guesswork to play with um, uh, expanding our overhead uh, at a time when uh, we're really very uncertain. Are we climbing out of this recession or not? Um, it doesn't appear to be, uh, so at least in Michigan, uh, although there have been a few glimmers of uh, hope in the real estate market. Um, but nonetheless, we are uh, uh, severely challenged with um, uh, a reduction in our revenue stream. And uh, if I had <coughs> my brothers and we were going to spend the LERP money, I would spend it not on major roads in Southfield. Done a lot of work on that, but I would spend it on neighborhood streets. Uh, we have a lot of neighborhood streets that are in, in poor shape, and we also have neighborhoods that have drainage issues. That's where I would spend the money. Um, I really feel that we need to maintain what we have, um, and that um, uh, I'd like to see the center go forward, but I'd like to see it privately funded. I personally would contribute. Uh, if we develop the fund for the Nature Center, I'd be happy to <coughs> donate to it, and I would be happy to recruit others to do the same. And the, I would hope that the people that spoke uh, uh, against the mayor's veto this evening would be uh, willing to join that effort as well. We can start a grassroots committee, just as Gail Barber did uh, years ago with the Bavarian property. Um, Gail knows that uh, Gail called me, uh, that, that beautiful 16 acres with uh, mature um, virgin forest trees um, that a developer wanted to come in and clear cut it and so on uh, and put expensive houses on, on, on the sensitive riverbank of uh, the Rouge. And uh, we got that property and a lot of it was through um, local, uh, it was really grassroots e effort. And I think that this can be done uh, as well. Um, I, I believe that there will be grants in the future. Um, there are uh, various environmental funds, and I don't think that we have explored the um, um, possibility of um, major corporate donors. There are a number of corporations that the environment is their thing, um, and to me this would be an easy, uh, an easy sell. So I find myself in a dilemma as uh, an educator, an environmentalist, um, but uh, I think the fiscally responsible thing is uh, not to be seduced by a grant that's only going to pay part of this um, uh, cost uh, and instead uh, work for another revenue stream uh, that I think there are enough people in Southfield who would would support this and reach out to others uh, uh, beyond uh, the le city limits of Southfield. I will be supporting the mayor's veto. Thank you. Um, you know, I had an opportunity to be a part of the ribbon cutting several years ago at Carpenter Lake, and it was at that time decided that we would be uh, building an ancient interpretive center that was always in our mind and always a part of the vision when we established uh, the Carpenter Lane project. I believe that we must complete 
care about our safety. I think making a decision with this particular project, all too often we think about the here and now and not about the future and not about globally, even as we think about exposing our children to higher learning, exposing our children to the awareness of our environment, exposing our children and encouraging stewardship and responsibility. You know, it all really just comes down to, unfortunately, a, a personal and a selfish decision when we don't think about the children and don't think about the next generation. You know, I have a letter here from Dr. Wanda Cook Robinson, and she says that the Southfield, this is dated September the 26th, 2011, that the Southfield Public School District enthusiastically supports the City of Southfield's efforts in developing a nature interpretive center at the Carpenter, Carpenter Lake Nature Preserve. Southfield Public Schools will work with the City of Southfield to develop classroom curriculum and real-time field learning opportunities. We believe that the educational opportunities provide, provided through the Nature Interpretive Center will greatly enhance our ability to develop an appreciation and awareness of the value of the natural world and better prepare our students for environmental stewardship. I think that says a lot because if we restrict our thinking to now, we really are ignoring the children that we need to preserve our nature in the future and to preserve our environment in the future. You know, the, city, the city's library was built in the face of financial difficulty and economic hard times, and that was a $37 billion building, and here we are talking about a $2.1 million interpretive center that's not for the, not for the adults that are old and gray-haired and can barely walk, but it's for the young kids, giving them exposure to the environment and being responsible and giving them, uh, moving them from sitting in front of the TV, moving them from sitting in front of the computers, moving them from handheld video games to getting out and exposing, walking, learning. You know, all too often, you know, our kids are not even making their brains tick anymore because they're in front of a computer and in front of a video game. But here we have an opportunity to get them outdoors and even walk a little bit. So I, I, I'm definitely for moving forward with this project and I would not support the mayor's veto. I think we'll lose a valuable opportunity to impact our community for the future and for the children. Southfield, we state it all the time, we're a premier city, and here we have an opportunity, a small window that we can walk through to commit to build this facility. And as the old saying says, a bird in hand is better than two in the bush. So we wait for the future, hoping that somebody else is going to come through and give us the money. I think that's not wise. I think we've got to act now. I think we have the, the resources to do it. There's been an individual that states, why not put together a Friends of Carpenter Lake? I think that's a brilliant idea. And I think we should move forward. Thank you very much. Mr. Frazier. Yes. Uh, I want to say that uh, arriving at my decision was not easy at all. It's probably one of the toughest decisions that I've had to make as a, a city council person. That's what I raised my hand and swore that I would do. I would make the best decision that I knew how to make for the city of Southfield, uh, state of Michigan, county of Oakland, state of Michigan, and whatever Nancy told me to say. <laughs> and I took it seriously, and I take it seriously, and I've always taken it seriously. So coming to my conclusion, or coming to my answer, was very difficult. And I apologize to my wife for sometimes setting up in the middle of the night in bed saying, oh, as I was, as this went through my mind as I was trying to, to come to a conclusion. But let me, let me uh, say a couple of things that, uh, first of all, everyone seems to be locked on 
couldn't that be an option to work with the public school system to use one of the closed schools, for instance Eisenhower, which is not that far from Carpenter Lake, to do the the uh, classroom work and then take a trip to Carpenter Lake to prove what was talked about in the classroom. We heard people came to the microphone tonight to say that they drive to Dearborn. The closest one to Southfield is, is uh, Farmington Hills, which means that the students are getting the education today, but not at Carpenter Lake. Oh, it's nice to have it at Carpenter Lake, and I want to have it at Carpenter Lake, but we've got some money problems that we have to solve, and I think there are some higher priorities at this point in time to spend the money on than the Nature Center at Carpenter Lake as it's drawn today. Maybe we could find a way to, to convert one of the closed schools to the Interpretive Center. Let me, also let me tell you some, some things, and these aren't new things because I've been bringing these things up for years that concern me about how we spend our money. <coughs> First thing is the code house. The code house for years and years has been a historical house that was purported to be part of the Underground Railroad and we own the code house but we let it get into absolute disarray because we didn't <coughs> use it for anything and it sat there and it almost fell down. We had a, a city administrator that's passion was to redo, uh, refurbish old houses, and he worked out a deal where he could live in that house and refurbish it, and he and he did, and it ended up getting an award because he did such a great job on it. Today it's sitting empty. It's probably going to go backwards if we don't do something with it. But that's going to cost the Parks and Rec money because we mow the lawn, we the leaves, uh, and I'm not, I'm not even saying that we ought to sell it, but I think we ought to do something with it that makes it valuable and doesn't let it go back into the disarray. Another thing that I've been talking about for a long time, we've got a house at, uh, at the Burke Center that's been empty ever since it's been moved there. And again, it was part of the historical part of Southfield, so it was moved there for some reason. But we put tons of money in that house, and it's still empty. And we haven't done anything with it. We just spent over $200,000 refurbishing the Simmons house, where uh, Human Services is, but it's not fully ADA uh, accessible. Um, and I asked about that, and the, the, the answer I got was, well, if the people that are on the second floor have a meeting with someone that's handicapped, they can come downstairs. But if the house is busy, there's no place to meet because they don't have enough meeting rooms. So um, those are a couple of things. Um, our state shared revenue is projected to go down somewhere between 8 and 11 percent again next year. Our homes are only worth about 40% of what they were about five years ago, and if they go down another 11%, or excuse me, they're about 60%, so if they go down another 8 to 11%, our houses are going to be worth about half as much, which means our tax revenues are going to go down again, which means that we'll have less money <coughs> to, to do the things that we need to do. Um, We had, a, we had an agreement with Little Caesars, and uh, Mr. Fricassi talked about that, with the ice arena, and they were here, and that took the burden off of the Parks and Rec Department, because Little Caesars was going to put a lot of money in, they were going to put a slide of ice in, they were going to build an addition on, and we were going to have a, uh, like a gym on the thing, and they changed their personnel and decided to go in a different direction, and they're no longer there. So Parks and Rec has that back, mm -hmm. has something that they have to uh, maintain. When when Will Caesars was there, they did great. They everything that uh, Mr. Picasso said 
did, they did. It's gorgeous, but it's still coming back. We had a field zone. The field zone was uh, built in the in the basement of the old, old library, and it was funded by outside folks, and the funding dropped dropped or dried up. And it's kind of like uh, Mr. Moss said the. Uh, the kid that went away to college, got his college education, can't find a job now, he's living back in the basement. The, the field zone came back, and now the city is funding that, which we had not planned on doing. Uh, Evergreen Road is in shambles. Uh, we have uh, foreclosed homes that still need to, we still need to find people to put in those foreclosed homes so that we can have the houses uh, uh, filled with, with tax-paying people, and we're looking, we're trying to attract young people. Uh, I'm very active with Michigan Municipal League, and place is the important thing that people are looking at now. Young families, young people find a place that they enjoy, and then they find a job after they get there. Um, we need to find a way to attract young families with young children that will be <coughs> students in the Southfield Public Schools and take part in the things that we do. The, I'm sure that the uh, uh, Interpretive Center would satisfy part of that, but we've got to do a lot more things. Before Mr. Waterhouse left, he talked about building a splash pad over at at Beachwoods to attract young kids. I know I have four grandchildren that it's like going to the candy store when they get a chance to go to a, a park with, with a splash pad. And it doesn't take, you don't have to have lifeguards there. So it's, it's a fun place to go for the kids and it's not as expensive. We're down over 200 people in Southfield and if our our state share of revenue comes in at 8 to 11 percent less again next year. We're going to go down some more, which means parks of parks and recreation will probably have to step to the plate and get smaller. If we put more locations for them to cover with fewer people, that just means that they're not going to do the kind of job that we're going to, they're not going to be able to do the kind of job that we're going to be proud to have them uh, expect from, from them. So, uh, and if we, if we dig into the LURF fund, which is our emergency fund, what happens when we get another West Nile virus problem, or an Emerald Ash Borer problem, or a Gypsy Moth problem? Uh, where are we going to get the money to address that? Also, uh, about 10 years or so ago, we uh, spent a little over $50 million putting sewers on the west side of the city. And we expected people to tie into the sewers, which would reduce the amount of pollution that failed septic systems would cause on the west side. Well, it turned out that they're not doing it as as quickly as we wanted. Some are very resistant to uh, tying in because it's so expensive. At $30 or more a running foot to trench to the uh, sewer system and the houses are on big lots and they set way back. Uh, it's not feasible for uh, some of the people to, to do that. So we've created a, a fund that they can borrow uh, money to offset some of the cost of hooking up to it. I, I really can't tell you how, how many people have taken up, taken, the, taken advantage of that, but if it's a senior or a senior uh, family that lives in there, a husband and wife, and they can't afford it, and they have a septic system that fails, and so they're polluting the, their land, are we going to condemn the house? Or are we going to do something to help them hook up to the septic or to the sewer system? Um, also, um, just after Christmas or just after uh, Thanksgiving, the there was a minibus which was an omnibus bill in the 
that went to the president and he signed reducing the uh, CDBG by 12% uh, from 2011 to 2012. So our CDBG money is probably going to be 12% less, which is our administrative costs. It's also uh, going to probably get into chore, toss, uh, the uh, uh, ship program. Uh, so we're going to have less money to spend on that uh, from the CDBs that, that we've covered on over the years. Um, one of the hardest things that we have to do is say no to a good project. But taking all of these things into consideration, I just have to support the mayor in her veto and I cannot support at this time, and I'd love to do it, but I cannot support at this time to build the interpretive center at uh, Carpenter Lake as it is designed at this time. I'm open to sitting down and trying to figure out if, if we can do it at one of the closed schools or some other option, but at this time I just cannot say that I've done my fiduciary responsibility by making the decision to go ahead in this project. Thank you. All right. Um, Madam Chair, <coughs> and let me just say this. Uh, I'm hearing these things and, you know, it's including the mayor's comments in paper like the city of <coughs> falling off the edge of a cliff. In the calendar year, the last calendar year, the uh, parks and recreation uh, did improvements a total of two million six hundred seventy-one thousand dollars, and this is uh, a lot of money when you figure that it's been budgeted and not only budgeted but contracted out and completed. Then we spent over six six million dollars in local streets, major streets, water and sewers in the city. So we're spending the money in a way that we can ensure that the city is safe and secure, as infrastructure is ahead of what we expected to get done. We uh, have done a lot of things and in trying to improve the, the city. The city's only 50 years old. We're still a young city in comparison to others. And you have to be competitive. You have a product here. Uh, and the city can be looked at as a product. How do you sell a product? How does a major department store sell a product? By creating more to be competitive. And, and I heard Mr. Frazier and I heard Mr. Cyber talk, but you know what you're talking about that I spend one mile of road, which is a million dollars, or do I pay the $900,000 and get something that has some attraction to the city? Um, we just spend $189,000 to change the way the islands are in the library, which a lot of residents feel that they really don't get full value out of the library because it's used by others. So I guess I'm looking at, you know, even the Ford Motor Company, when they're facing uh, the economy and uh, bankruptcy and those things, and, and Mr. Malali just went forward, built a product, sold the product, is on top of the game. I think that's what cities have to do. We have to stay on top of the game. Those other things that Mr. Fraser had mentioned, true, they have to be done. What it has to be done is the boards, the council, the mayor have to get together and schedule those, those things to get done and get them done. I mean, there's nothing holding anything back from attempting to get these things completed. Yes, buildings were moved out of the expressway site into the bird, and they are empty. But that's what happens. That's the kind of thing that you, you do because you wanted to save a historical building, and maybe it didn't work out to your satisfaction. But you have to keep taking chances. You cannot sit back and say the world go by and I'm taking some risks. And I think that the city, to maintain its integrity and to keep up with the Joneses, have to be competitive and have to be built for the future. And the young people who are going to be taking my place and others up here have to see it the same way, that you cannot be stagnant. You have to continue to go forward. We've never had to worry whether or not this money is going to be there the next day or not, but we found ways to achieve things. Even in 
the uh, environment that we are now in. And the city has always gone forward and has always been unique and creative. And you will continue to be that way. And it, but you have to continue to go forward. Madam Chair. Uh, I, do you want to go ahead and take a Well, go ahead. No, no, I'll, 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 I, I, I want to. I want to say we have one part of my parks and rec has its own millage. During the time that we asked for an increase in millage, parks and rec was on. We have one part of my. And if we really want to be competitive, we talked about attracting new families. I'll tell you what. Take a family to Troy parks and rec facility. They're cool. They're indoor meeting rooms. They're community centers. Take them to, to Dearborn, to their community center. Take them over to Farmington Hill. And then you take them to our beach woods. You bring them over here to our correct facility. There's one pot of money. We are not competitive. And if our goal truly is to be competitive with these other cities, then we should fix what we have updated. It is an embarrassment. Our city is not falling apart. We have so many gyms. But we have fallen apart in this parks and rec area. Just like you said, we cannot use parks and rec money to pay for any police officer. We cannot use it to buy a police car. But what I'm talking about is clearly parks and rec money. And we must invest in our infrastructure. And ladies and gentlemen, if you say, yeah, they need to be fixed, but we only have one kind of money that is shrinking. It is not going to get bigger. Our city administrator have already said next year, Park Direct must cut their budget at minimum by 10%. And if this decision is passed, you're increasing their obligation for, uh, for operations. I love that when this conversation was started. And again, this is a sense of, sense of urgency and, and priority because of the timeline of a grant. Councilwoman, Jordan said, why can't this be a win-win? I've heard people say, you know, other communities would be glad to come into this. Then why don't we do what our governor is saying, collaborate. Mm -hmm. Bring, bring Farmington Hill, bring Royal Oak, bring them to the table and say, we can have our own nature center right here in Carpenter Lake. Let's all go in together and let's build a, a state-of-the-art nature preserve center. And then that is truly something that I could get my arms around. You've already said these other communities are going to come use it, and I, I'm not opposed to that. But why should we pay the brunt of operating it? And then people are saying, we can walk through there, we can use the churches. And we, it's already been stated. It's going to have limited hours of operation. It's not going to be an open place where you can just go in and wander in and, and have interactive things. It's going to be a building that will be open as reserved. There's going to be a set amount of hours. And what I had heard is that it will be maybe three days a week. But that's another issue that calls the question, what is the plan? I had a, 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 a resident come up and say that there is a plan of action, that they were going to do all these things, and that the, the Rules Committee was going to do that. That hasn't been brought to council, not that I've heard. So are we adopting a building without any clue of what the operation and the function is going to be? Now, if there was a meeting with someone that solidified a plan for this, I did hear that we wanted part-time contractual people, that we did want limited hours. And those are the kind of things that we're not talking about. And if I could just sum this up the way I see it, very clear. You have a home, and Ms. forgot to your point, it's 50 years old. All of our homes are around 50, 40 years old. You have to put a new roof on it, you got to paint it, you, sometimes you have to uh, redo the kitchen, update your kitchen, because the kitchens are obsolete, so they're more energy efficient. Plumbing, those are the things you have to do. But if you have a 50-year-old home and go build a brand new garage next door to it, and it's the state-of-the-art garage, Everybody got to say, wow, that's the best garage I've ever seen. But the house, why didn't they update the house they live in? Why did they re uh, re allow the house that they're living in 
absolute wonderful addition to our city. But why don't we plan it so it's not a financial burden to us? I think that collaboration with communities is excellent. I would love to have, we have the ground, we have a site, uh, site plan already <coughs> developed, we have the drawing and the architect, architecture of it. Bring these communities that would use it. And then our children can use it. You know, the letter that uh, our superintendent, yes, she would support it. She doesn't have money to build, but she's trying to keep her building going. She would love to support it with curriculum and with, and with teachers, but she, frankly, she's trying to keep her building going. And so this is an opportunity. And, I, and this, someone said, well, this is so far from politics for me. This is about us doing the right thing. And I fundamentally believe this. This has nothing to do with whoever presented this. If we found a way to fund this, and if we found a donor that will come in tomorrow, I'll be standing right there with you and, and happy, excited to cut the ribbon. And, and when we make the decision that we have to look just at today, how many people today are facing foreclosures of their home because they look only at today when they sign a mortgage, bought a house, and said, you know what, I can afford it today, and didn't look at the, at the future. And now they're sitting there in a foreclosure situation because they didn't plan, they didn't put that cushion, that nest egg in the bank. And, and, and those of us who are in this baby boom, boomer age, who were raised by people from the Depression, was constantly told, you always keep money in the bank, you never spend your last, and you better make sure any bill that you make, you can sustain it, over a period of time. And that's where I'm operating from. I'm operating from that. I want this bill. But I mean, it's, it's so many people that came to the uh, podium that have some great ideas. The different organizations that can come together and fundraise and say, we have a commitment. We want uh, the, the Rouge River people, the Nature Conservancy of Michigan. All of us want the Nature Preserve Center to be a regional, open county. That's an excellent point. We pay taxes in open county. What happened when we stood up and fought? We got them to take over Carpenter Lake. I mean, on the Catawba Park. That has been a win-win for the city. Excellent. Why can't we pursue those types of, of resources so that, Joe, you know, you're absolutely right, everything you said. Councilman Jordan, you're absolutely right about the education of our children. I'm not disagreeing with it. I am not a person here disagreeing with any of the attributes of this. But I'm saying we are putting ourselves in a position and all of us at this table know that we've had the budget meeting where we're constantly told that we cannot afford it. The library, we went to the public, they passed the mill so that they could afford to build it. They have not had to, they just recently were reducing revenue, they even had to talk about looking at the funds. They've been able to fund it with the funds that the taxpayers have given them. But this is not going to be the situation. Lastly, and I want to end. Every fire, fire or policeman that came to the podium to speak, I did not speak to any of them. But I will tell you, regardless of their address, when I call 911, I want them to respond and take care of me. And I can tell you, we have one of the best police forces in this area, and I'm proud of them. So when they come to the mic, regardless of their address, I want them to know that they're respected, and that I wish they had used a different avenue than tonight to come to the mic on this, but I respect them, and I do not want the issue of their address to be demeaning or using something to say that they're not worth because many of us have seen them at work, and I know those of us who needed them and called them, they were there, they were respectful, and they take care of themselves. I just want that on the record. Madam Chair. Uh, Madam Chair, I Everything you said as far as, as uh, fixing the buildings that we have, uh, you're quite aware that we have a Parks and Recreation Board. We also have council people and the mayor that can make recommendations at budget time of what's, on the, what's going to have to happen to repair the buildings, have a plan to, to do it. There's money available to do it. They keep bringing up the pool and the lockers and the showers. You know that the pool does not need regulations any longer. It has to have zero depth for handicapped seniors. And so the whole pool is, is not 
and regulation and that curtails what we're going to do with it. It's going to be all tore out of what is the recommendation from Parks and Recreation. Uh, the previous uh, Parks and Recreation Director, uh, he seemed fit to support this and go along with it. And I guess what it really amazes me is from 1985 to present, there has been 20, 43 opportunities for you to veto. Because these are the steps that it took to get to where we are today. And, and I guess I, I really don't understand why on the last day of the last moment that, that all of a sudden we put a, a, an axe to it. And, and that is a lot of work by a lot of people. And I said it's always been with the with the proper actions of council, the mayor, and staff people. And, and here we sit tonight and, and saying, well, you know, 43, 43 times, and you should have 44 and 45. I just don't understand how many of and I have been discussing this, this project in the manner in which we are. And I'm not solely bent on this, I, but I've got calls, I've got emails. I mean, there's a lot of families that look at this, not, and I don't, I don't know why they're not here tonight, but they are really looking at this as an opportunity. They enjoy the preserve. They look forward to attending more. They wonder what you're going to do with it. They read in the reporter that uh, the magazine that, that this big, beautiful building is coming into play. And, uh, and I mean, the Great Lakes Reporter. There's a whole, there's a whole thing. All right. And I'm sitting here and saying, what happened that we got awards, we got interested, we've gone through, we've got national awards and state awards, and, and, and the plan for the project moved on since 1985, and here we are in the year 2014, 2012, in, in, in building a project. And like you said, it said that there was 43 times in an opportunity to that. I made mean the speed up. We are still spending money to go on trips, and nobody cares about the economy when we're doing that. And why are we now turning on this particular item to pick out of all the items that we have before us and pick on that to shut down something that is considered by a lot of people in the city? Like I said, I don't know why they're not here tonight, but I got tons of emails, I got tons of calls, and saying they're for it. And maybe people want to step out out of the football games or something and come to these meetings so that people can, you know, council people are there to hear what they really think. And you know, I'm on the street constantly, you know that. And, and I have, and I have people just can't wait for this thing to occur. And they've been looking forward to it. Just like it took 18 years for us to get Carpenter Lake, it may take us a year longer. And I truly believe if we put our effort into getting these communities, these organizations to support this. Maybe, but why wasn't that, that done? Yeah. And 43 times I had an opportunity why to, to go and, and address this with the business community, knowing it was this coming forward. We didn't and, have to and go and to our village. Is that, that village never, changed the whole world. I don't think anybody knew it was going to come to this. I don't think we were, any council member that has been here is not looking at this project that that they had to go out and try to save it by going out to the business community to raise funds. I never heard of that since I've been here. And, and so, yeah, there's an opportunity to, but most people who give money to it, you either put their name on it or whatever have you, have to be sold on this thing is going to happen. Once it's approved and happens, you're going to have interested parties to face it, maybe put their name on it, maybe a Myers, maybe Lear. It doesn't matter. We have a lot of corporations here. They just, they just gave, what, $5 million to Detroit? So, so these opportunities, we're not knocking on the doors for specific things. We did for the field zone. They came in, they built the, uh, they put in the, uh, put in the, the uh, auditorium. They put in all the computers. Pistons came and put in the, the floor. I mean, you know, I guess if you go out like Scott Griffin did, you go out and, and hit the people, you can make things happen. Okay, but I'd like to call the question. I'm sorry, but there are people who want to speak, and I have not spoken yet. Well, doesn't that take precedence here to call the question? 
I haven't said a thing yet. I'm listening. But I would prefer the president to say something. I spent all weekend with her evaluating what we're doing here tonight. And I would rather have her speak to you and tell you what I think is the truth. So if she agrees, I would I would proceed with that president. Uh, Ms.
building and the, and the nature center for so many years. It didn't just come up last year. Every council member, that, every council meeting that we had, every site plan committee we had, the council was fully enthusiastic and supporting us. I talked to the program director at the uh, U of, uh, University of Michigan Nature Interpretive Center a couple times, and he called me this morning and said he wanted to be here tonight, but couldn't. But he said we would get tons of favorable publicity for this Nature Interpretive Center. He said people come into his office on a daily basis saying how great it is to live in Dearborn and how proud they are to have this Nature Interpretive Center, how good it makes them feel about having this. Even the mayor comes into his office and says how great it is to have this Nature Interpretive Center. It's basically supported by the University of Michigan, but which has um, a, lot of, a lot of volunteers. And they have offered, I'm jumping ahead a little bit here, but we've talked about having volunteers and part-time staff. You don't open something immediately, seven days a week or even five days a week, until you find out as people get used to it and start to use it. Otherwise, you're going to be sitting there. You wouldn't do that with any place. The library is different because everybody uses the library on a daily basis. The fact is that you, you can use volunteers. The mayor said you can't count on volunteers, and she said I want to you. If we didn't count on volunteers, we wouldn't have our lot, any of our boards and commissions. We wouldn't have our um, uh, we wouldn't have any of our we wouldn't have our choirs in church. We wouldn't have our Sunday school teachers. We wouldn't have our emergency management people. We wouldn't have the uh, library. Um, what is it? The board that. Uh, the board that, uh, I, I don't recall saying that. I don't friends of the library. Friends of the we did. You said you can't count on I don't recall saying that. that. So I would say that that's incorrect. You did make it. But, never, but here's what I want to say. Yeah, Volunteers at all of the nature centers teach the classes. That doesn't mean they're untrained. The uh, University of Michigan volunteered, this is through the Nature Interpretive Center, that if we have volunteers and we want one of them to be trained to actually make these curriculum and, and um, related to school curriculums that they would train these people for us. Now the advantage to, for the school children, and this really is about the future, is that many of the adults that they don't care about it, they walk, they don't use it, but the children need it. We are responsible for the next generation. We're trying to teach them. We want to be a green city. We're trying to teach them about the necessity of appreciating the natural world. Because all we've done, our, as adults and our first, uh, generations, have destroyed it. We've cut everything down, <coughs> building and building and building and paving everything over. And we fought that battle in the city. We fought it and the environmentalists said, we need to preserve some. And other people on the council said, no, we could put a building there. Can we sell that nature? nature piece that we got grants for, can we sell it? We put a building on it. Great. We talked to, we had an a, a interest expressed by the um, <coughs> LTU, and you heard a gentleman here that works at LTU. LTU would like to do some uh, student um, work with, uh, with this group and, and provide some uh, input into it and with their graduate students. We're going to have in this building the, next to Lawrence Tech. Lawrence Tech is the first LEED certified um, geothermal building, but the Nature Center will be the second in this area geothermal building and LEED certified. This is a great thing to start teaching our kids about science. We are falling behind all of the other countries in the developed world in science and engineering. This is a way to make <coughs> connections to help the next generation. We are so far behind as a country in education and particularly in science and engineering. And this is to help to make that connection for them. There's so many benefits to this. What bothers me the most about being here tonight in this situation is we've had, we've had years and years of knowing this was coming, meetings every, several meetings last year. Nobody said, well, let's slow down. Maybe we need to take a second look. Maybe we don't want to do this right now. Everybody said, go ahead when we were about to lose the third extension, and that was because some changes had been made to the plan. There were some changes that one of the council people made. There were some changes that uh, had to be made for the, for the site, for the build, for the, the, the roof of it. We intended originally to take a house that existed there and redevelop it and use that for the nature center. When they got into the house, there was so much black mold, there was so much deterioration, it had to be torn down and it was used for the fire department used it as a uh, a practice 
buildings. But that was what the intention was. So there was always intended that there would be a nature center, interpretive center, for the children to use to help their education. It supplements what the schools are doing. The schools cannot do all of this type of training. It's up to us as adults to prepare the next generation. I, I just to stress with me that with all of these, all of these opportunities to say let's cut back, that we haven't done it. I want to talk about the work of the local improvement revolving fund. We can't take that and spend it. Everybody talks about spending it. What is being proposed tonight and what is being proposed at this whole session over the past few weeks is not to spend the Buller phone. It is to loan some of the money for this project to the Parks and Recreation Department, to their, to their department to pay for this. The first few years would be interest only. Interest only. Annual, first three years, 29000 interest only payments. That's, that's cheap. And then and it goes a little bit. I mean, this is something we can afford. We've got plenty of people in our Parks and Recreation Department that some of them can be uh, spared to spend some time over there. Mary Carlock, our Parks uh, Planner, would be spending time there too. As the, as the usage increases, we can increase the people. But that's, that's uh, I want to get back to the LERP fund. We're not spending the LERP fund. We can't, we could spend the LERP fund to do some street repairs, but we would be, we would demolish that fund very quickly. Major road repairs have to be done where we pay a, a portion of it, but the county or particularly the state pays a portion of it too. They're not willing to do that right now, so we have to live with the situation. Um, the, um, the mayor said our, that our word means something. She said, I believe our word means something. I want to quote something that happened last year uh, when we were talking about uh, Mr. Frazier asked if the state grant was a matching grant, and Ms. Carla replied, it was a matching grant, however, it can be matched with donations, and I want to talk about donations in a minute. Mayor Lawrence gave kudos to Mr. Waterhouse, who was our Parks and Recreation Director for the years, and she said, the head of the DNR used Southfield as an example of keeping their word and using the money properly. Well, now we're not keeping our word. Now we're backing off. Now we're going backwards and thinking retrenching. Nothing has changed since last year, except that slowly the economy is getting better. And all of a sudden we're saying, well, we got to fix this, fix this, fix this. The Parks and Recreation fund balance is $6 million. They have money. The LERP fund is close to $8 million. We're not going to spend that money. It's for making internal loans, most of which get paid back. We used it to expand the golf course, which I thought at the time we didn't need to do because there was so much overbuilding of golf courses. But that's, it's used for those kind of projects. And it gets paid back in most cases by the department of borrowing the money. This, let me talk about raising money right now. Uh, we could go out and raise money, but we have to have council approval to set up a fund for this project. We cannot accept money until we have that fund set up and it's dedicated, and correct me, um, to the attorney, if I, if you hear me say something incorrect about this, but this uh, money has to be on a fund that is dedicated merely to a specific project. That's, I think, a safety precaution so that, you know, some unethical people maybe don't get in and use it for something else. Mm. We haven't established that. We've had people that want to contribute m money to us. I had a call last week from a corporate donor who was interested in the project, had actually been over there and looked at it because they'd heard about it. And the first part of the conversation was, we'll, we'll donate $25,000. So after a few minutes of conversation, that went up to $100,000. But we can't just accept that money right now. We, and, and, and until we have that fund established, we can't well, make money, collect money, I'm sorry, raise money. But here's the thing. This loan that is being, uh, the work loan, gives us the opportunity, because it's a loan on interest only, it gives the parks and recreation only has to pay a small amount of, of interest, small amount of interest, it's not going to hurt them one bit. That gives us time to raise corporate money. We can't do it if we just cut this off and say we're done. And the, the uh, comment by Mr. Moss that it, it doesn't hurt us, it does hurt us. We don't get a third extension from the DNR. They'll give you two, in this case, we had to go there and fight for it. And this is brand new people under the governor. They're not the people that we knew that trusted us and said we've always done, kept our word and done, done our job. We had to fight for that. 
we convinced them that we had done such good work in the past, they went to bed for us. They went to bed for us. Now they're going to hear that after four or five people on the council said, we don't want to we want, don't want to lose the grant, so make the effort to try to save the grant. We had two days to do this because it was going to be gone. They, did, they went to that first, and now we're saying the mayor's veto and the council doesn't support it. But up until last year, they did. And all we've seen is slow progress in, in the state and in the, in, the, um, in the economy generally. Our automotive companies are doing well. It's slow, but it's recovering. And it disturbs me that we're going backwards. We can't, if we lose these loans, that's money we, that we had to, you know, to uh, birds in the hand or birds in the, uh, sorry, birds in the hand or to and push. That's money that we're throwing away. That's close to millions of dollars that we are throwing away. Um, there are things, there are places that we could find money from within our own operations. There are things that we're losing money on that we could cease doing and we could actually come up with the money. But we haven't even taken a look at that. Um, the state grants will will be harder to get. Once you default, they are harder to get, and the, the amount of money is definitely going down. This is one-time money right now. It's from selling mineral rights. Uh, just give me a moment here. Our, the last thing I want to say, well, two, two things, two things, and I'll, then I'll finish. Um, there's an article, a recent article in a uh, local paper that talks about Mount Clemens business community cases to support stars and strikes. Mount Clemens business community is again setting, getting set to uh, hold their Stars and Strikes Festival in the summer with monetary support, saying the public buzz and media attention the city receives during the event is worth every penny. Three day event is costing them $500,000, half a million. They have nothing to show for it but buzz and attention. $500,000. And they're spending it for a three day event with nothing to show for it. We have an opportunity to go out and collect corporate donations, but we have to have this project go forward and establish that fund, and the, and the council has to support it. To say we're not going to go out and establish the fund is going to make the, the corporation say, well, why are you canceling this? I mean, this is real, folks. This is, this is going backwards. This is, we said we, said we would keep our word. We raised if we were complimented for it, and now we're breaking our word. Um, I mentioned that LTU said that they would like to have their students involved, their advanced students involved somewhat uh, to help um, in teaching. I think I pretty much covered everything. All of, one last thing. All of the, go on the, go on the website, any of you that are interested. Every nature interpretive center in the area, and there's quite a few of them, all depend on volunteers. They all depend on volunteers to teach, and they all have education as the biggest component. The building is not just so that people can come in and look at displays. The building is there so that people can meet in a group. And to go off-site, you have to bus them if you want to take a school that's vacant. You have to bus them. <coughs> Who's going to pay for that? When they're on the site, using the site, doing the water testing, all the things that we've been doing, that some of the schools are doing in other ways, it's one place to do this. And it's invested in our future. And I'm really disillusioned that we are, we have no faith in our future. We have no faith in our corporate uh, community, our corporate culture. And we're looking for a way out instead of looking for a way to get the job done and keep our word. And that's very distressing to me. It's clear that the mayor has um, the old world with her override. I mean, I'm sorry, her veto will be sustained. Um, the alert is not a gift, it's a loan. And this makes it very easy for the next several years for Parks and Recreation to pay a minimum amount of money. It doesn't break them, it doesn't hurt them, and it gives us the opportunity to go out and raise money. And it makes no sense at this point in time to say all of a sudden we're not going to do it because my God, the sky is falling and we need a new community center. We've always needed those things. But we made a decision. We made a decision to build a library. We made a decision to do some repairs at the birth site. We had a building that was being used to, uh, for, for uh, serving our community members where the floor was caving in. It was dangerous. We had to do that. The work money is a loan. We cannot use it for highways. We cannot use it for salaries. 
It's a revolving fund. It gets, most of it gets paid back. Rarely ever does it not get paid back. There was one example, and that was the parking lot when the previous surface was put in because it had to be done. Anyway, that's um, Mr. Lang, and I, I think that's all I have to say. Now, now you know the reason why I didn't say anything until now. Um, Joan Seymour is correct, and it's all true. I spent this whole weekend going over this, going over and over and over. I come to the conclusion that we must go forward. We must. I'm going to tell you something. Joan Seymour went out and is getting a donation for $100,000. And this little lady can raise us $500,000. Nobody else can. I can raise $5,000. But, I believe in her. She's telling you the truth. I would, I would say we should take a chance on her. Take a chance on me. Take a chance on Sylvia Jordan. We are telling the truth. And we know it's going to work. There is a lot of money in our city. We have departments that have, one department has $44 million, another department has $7 million. There's a lot of money around. We're not in a crisis as Everybody thinks it's tough, but we're not in a crisis. There will not be a manager coming into South Wales like in Detroit. We know what we're doing. We have qualified people here to know what we're doing. Believe in us. You know, I hear so much talk. A lot of it is flawed. They don't know if they knew the truth, as I try to convince some people earlier. They have nothing against me, but just, you know, what they were told. Please, we are doing, Joan Seymour is doing a phenomenal job. She can save us. I hope with my help, the help of Jordan, I hope Don McCassie, we're thinking right. Please, listen to us. We know what we're doing. That's why I didn't get into it before. I knew this was going to be, to be spoken, and it's true. You learned the truth tonight. So let's, let's go forward. I know we can't overturn the veto. I wish we could. Because Actually, it's going to hurt us. It will make things fall apart. You will see in the near future it will fall apart, as other things have, if by bad decisions. Bad decisions. That's why I'm still here for all these years. I made very few bad decisions, most of them correct. And you put me back in. And here I am. So think, think. Let's have some common sense and hopefully go ahead with it. And don't look at people shaking their heads and doing this and doing that. We know what we're doing. Trust us. Thank you. I do have something else to say. It's about the, the uh, figures that our, our city manager gave us. Mr. Shred has been in charge of our budget and the Office of Management and Budget for many, many years before he became city manager. He's still doing that job. He's doing two full-time jobs. We've always trusted what he has told us. I've been on the Finance Committee probably at least eight years. I've probably been chairman of it, I would say, at least six years, five years continuously. So I'm very well versed on the city's finance. Not everyone in this council has taken an interest even to be on the finance committee, unfortunately. Mm. He told us, gave us a plan of how we could use the LURF money 
to re to have uh, the first several years only 29,000 annual burden, 29,000 dollars. That's huge, isn't it, to pay that? That's huge. That would break the park from that. And then for the next, uh, that's the first three years. Then for the next four years, it would raise, be raised to 44,000. These are just loans. Then after that, it would go up to 104,000. That's year, um, the year, year five. By that time, we would have raised all the money that we need. So there would be no, no opportunity for that to pay the money back. We've always trusted what he has done. We've always been able to count on it. He doesn't do this stuff you know, off the top of his head. He's an expert. So he's well educated. He's been doing it for us for years. We've always relied on it. All of a sudden, we're saying, some companies, excuse me, are saying, I don't think so. It's going to cost more to uh, staff this, or more to operate it, or more for. That's just off the top of their head. There's clearly, some people just don't want to do this, and it doesn't make sense. Um, the other thing, if we're talking about not spending money, I would like to know why no one raised the red flag about the greening of Beechwood. The greening of Beechwood. That came up last in the, in the past calendar year. We have a document here in front of each one of us that shows that we did uh, capital projects for Parks and Recreation over the last calendar year, as Mr. Fercasso pointed out, of almost two million, almost well, two million six hundred and seventy one thousand dollars capital projects that were done for parks and recreation. Part of that in the greening of Beachwood was six hundred and fifty thousand dollars that were spent from their funds. hundred and seventy nine thousand was an EPA grant. That means almost five hundred thousand, half a million, came out of their budget. Where were the red flags? Where were the objections? Where were the people saying, Well with me, we can't afford it? That's the way it is. This is embarrassing. This is inconsistent, it's flip-flopping, it's demoralizing, it's not keeping our word, and frankly, it's voodoo economics. It's voodoo economics, you're not hearing the truth. This shows no faith in the future, no faith in our corporate culture, no faith in our ability to raise money, looking to, for a no instead of trying to figure out how to get the job done. In my opinion, and I'm gonna say it pretty clearly, it's de-energizing, it's demoralizing, and this veto is disgusting. We're not, the veto wasn't about a chemical plant, it wasn't about a waste dump, it wasn't about an incinerator in a neighborhood, it wasn't even about an amusement park. It's about a nature center to train kids and train our next generation, and it makes no sense. Anyway, um... I'd like to say something. Yes, Mr. Fraser. You said a couple of things that I'm confused about. One of them is, the work isn't being spent, it's being loaned. Right. Did you say that? Yeah. Okay. And let's just create a, a scenario. Let's say that there's only a million dollars in the work fund. If we give the million dollars, loan the million dollars to the Parks and Rec to build the, the uh, interpretive center, And uh, Evergreen Road caves in. Have we spent the money or have we loaned the money? We have loaned the money to the Parks and Recreation Department because they have to pay it back in later years. But they have an $8 million. No, 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 no. Well, I'm talking about LERP, LERP money only. That's what I'm talking about. Okay. That's what I'm talking about. That's the you thing. said that they're going to start paying back only interest? For the first three years. <laughs> if Evergreen Road caves in, where are we going to get the money to fix Evergreen Road if there's only a million dollars in alert funds and we give it to the Parks and Rec to build the interpretive center? There's not just a million dollars in alert funds. I've I said I'm going to create a uh, scenario that we only have a million dollars. Right? It's a flawed scenario. No, it's not. I'm trying to make an I'm, I'm posing a situation. I'm trying to say, we are spending the money, we aren't loaning it. Because it's not available. You can't spend it twice. You can't spend it twice, you can only spend it once. And as long as the Parks and Rec is using it, it's, it's not available.
is getting better, mm -hmm. and uh, therefore we should make this decision. But the projections are it's going to get worse by 8 to 11 percent next year. Our, our uh, tax revenue is going down 8 to 11 percent. Tell me how that's better. Well, in general, the economy is. is I'm talking about tax dollars that we use. <laughs> what I'm trying to say is. When we talk to the public, we ought to talk clearly and say the right things. And I think you told them different than what the, what's real. Because if we loan the money, we can't spend it again. Well, we're not loaning all of the, all of the money. I don't understand you. There's still money left in the, in the fund. Okay, let's say that. Let's say that the whole work fund, I'm creating this Scenario. Let's say the whole work fund is only worth a million dollars, and we give it to the Parks and Rec for the interpretive center. If Evergreen Road caves in, do we have any money to fix Evergreen Road? That's hypothetical, and there's no, I, that's a ridiculous thing to do. Well, it's not any more hypothetical it than it that it's, being, it's not being spent. The point is that we're not giving them the whole work fund. We're not even loaning them the whole work fund. You're obviously. Not understanding my I, point. I do understand, but you're saying that there's a minimum amount there, and we loan all of that to them. We can't use it for other things, but we're not doing that. So there's, it's, it's pointless to, to discuss. We're not giving them all that. We're not even loaning them all of that. It's just a question of it. Madam Chair, I, I do want to comment on where were the red flags when we spent the money on beach list. That's exactly what I'm saying. We should be spending our money on our existing structures, structures improving them. If you go over to Beachwood, they improve the shelter, they improve the, the, the uh, tennis court, the landscape, and the, and the parking lot. That's what we should be doing with our money, investing in our existing structure. That was not a red flag, that was a green flag, and that's what we should be doing. Well, the point you of it is... said, where was the flag? Right, flag? but the point of it is, all of a sudden, we're, we're backtracking. If that was what we want to do, was just keep repairing... And we've, we've spent six million dollars in, in repairs. We have certain things that are going to be not as not as new as some of these new communities. We probably had a bond issue. We haven't done that. If it's only about dressing up our appearance and not doing anything new and not going forward, that's not what we're all about. That's a total change in the South Hill culture. We have to think of the future. We can pretty up all these things. Well, I don't support a bond issue for well, Parks and Rec at this time, but you know, wh whenever we get to this vote, I hope that right after we have the vote, we talk about where we're going next mm -hmm. and look at the future. I, for one, would like to see a citizen uh, committee um, formed to uh, look at avenues for moving forward with this that doesn't spend tax dollars, uh, whether it's collaborative through other communities or corporate donations or citizen, uh, a citizen campaign. Uh, let's look for the future on this. Uh, we've really uh, ground this to a very fine powder, and I think it's time to get the vote and then start where we go from here. No, I'm going to talk about money. I'm going to talk about mistakes where we all we're losing hundreds of thousands of dollars. We have a cornerstone development downtown, which we should not have. It became an autonomous government in, in within our government. They have consultants, which cost us a hundred thousand dollars. They get a two percent assessment from the area, which is, an, I don't know, millions maybe. <coughs> We're doing things that we shouldn't do. We're wasting money. We're throwing money out. We have people down there making hundreds of thousands of dollars in the outfit. They have an office. They bought furniture for $200,000. We lost control. There is money if we go after it. And we will. We will. I'm going to bring up so many things where we can 
get our money back. We have spent from the year 2004 to 2010 $24 million taxes we gave away. I'm the only one that objects, objects to the tax abatements. Now, there's this Denzo who gave us, who donated $150,000 to this project. When I found out about it, I didn't know. I said it's unethical because they're coming to us very shortly for maybe a $15 or $20 million tax abatement. Think, they gave us $150,000, then they're coming to us for tax abatement. Well, I fought so hard, we're sending it back to them. Took two months to do it. We have a lot of other problems. If we clean house, not clean house, clean up our methods a little bit, we'll have money here. We're not in a crisis, as I told you. And we won't be in a crisis. But Joan is correct. You can have any scenario you want, just like the polls. They take a poll here, the poll there, and the poll there. They're all, you know, made up questions to benefit them. That's what's happening here tonight, now. I suggest we go ahead with it. We think a little bit and go ahead with this. And trust us.
motion is approved to reconsider the matter. It's never back on the table. The motion, the veto by the mayor stands, and that's as far as it goes. Thank you. Okay, so, Mr. Lamb. Yes. Ms. Jordan. Yes. Mr. Frazier. No. Mr. Procasi. Yes. Ms. Seymour. Yes. Okay, you've got one, two, three, four in favor of reconsidering the resolution that was adopted November 28, 2011. And that passed. Now, the next motion could be made by any member of council to now re-adopt the approval of the carpenter lane in Dayton. But that will take five votes. That will take the two-thirds majority. Madam Chair, I move that for the re-adoption. Support. Second on the motion by Mr. Procasi. Support is on Ms. Jordan to re-adopt the motion to move ahead with carpenter lane. Let's say the motion to re-adopt the resolutions are again before you for consideration. A motion to re-adopt the resolutions approving the carpenter lane major turbine center may be made by any council member. The motion is supported and voted in favor by at least five council members. The mayoral vote will have been overridden and the resolutions will have once again been adopted. Okay. Thanks. Mr. Procasi. Yes. Mr. Frazier. No. Ms. Jordan. Yes. Mr. Lamb. Yes. Mr. Moss. No. Mr. Seiber. No. Ms. Seymour. Yes. We have four in favor, three against. The mayor is vetoed for carpenter lane. Yes. All right. This concludes this meeting. We're going to take a 15-minute break.